The UFC's 155-pound lightweight division is finally going to get some clarity after the retirement of its dominant undefeated champion in Habib the Eagle Nurmagomedov at UFC 254 back in October of 2020. After a dominant second round triangle choke submission in which he made the challenger and interim champion Justin Gaethje go unconscious, he would sit in the middle of the cage weeping due to the loss of his father, Abdul Manap, from complications with COVID-19. And he said due to the wish of his mother, he would no longer compete in professional mixed martial arts. 29-0, undefeated, with barely any adversity throughout his entire career in terms of in-cage competition, the eagle was no more. Now, at UFC 269, on December 11, 2021, we are going to get the battle between the two absolute best at 155 pounds, which should have been the battle that took place at UFC 262, between the Diamond, the former interim lightweight champion with two victories over Max Holloway and two victories over the notorious Conor McGregor in Dustin the Diamond Poirier, going up against the current undisputed UFC lightweight champion, who defeated Michael Chandler at UFC 262 in the second round after overcoming adversity and being dropped in the first to come back with a brutal left hook and then a follow-up left hook up against the cage as Chandler tried to scramble up to his feet in Charles Dobronx Oliveira. Prior to this title-winning performance and shutting fans' mouths over not being able to overcome adversity due to past performances, he has also earned victories over Kevin the Motown Phenom Lee and most recently prior to the title shot, a dominant three-round decision victory, very close to getting a finish in that fight, against the former streaking lightweight contender who was thought to be one of the best lightweights in the world, in Tony El Kakui Ferguson. He will now get one of the toughest tests of his career against UFC veteran, former interim lightweight champion, and one of the best fighters in the world from Lafayette, Louisiana, in Dustin the Diamond Poirier. Poirier, in his own right, is coming off three back-to-back-to-back victories. First, in an all-out war against Dan Hooker back in June of 2020. But most recently, two back-to-back victories over a man who finished him in the first round at UFC 178 in the notorious Conor McGregor. His most recent win over the notorious one came at UFC 264 back in July of 2021. After a very close first round where McGregor looked to be returning to form with light on his feet, in and out movement, spinning back kicks and front kicks to the body, followed up with some brutal left low kicks which we saw him showcase the most in his rematch against Nate Diaz at UFC 202. However, this fight would be a little bit different as Dustin Poirier would check a teep kick to the body off of his elbow and damage the left shin of Conor McGregor which was damaged coming into the fight according to McGregor himself. Then, he would check a low kick but counter it with a left hand of his own, and McGregor would fall down at the end of the first round. This would lead to a doctor stoppage after McGregor had shattered his shin and broke his left foot. But now, Dustin Poirier, after beating him the second time in the rematch at UFC 257 via knockout, has two victories over the notorious one and is knocking on the door of finally becoming the undisputed UFC lightweight champion. The battle against Dole Bronx in December will be one of the most technical fights in the history of the lightweight division and is definitely between two of the best fighters in the world and definitely the two best at 155 pounds. Will the power and pressure of the diamond shatter Dole Bronx or will Dole Bronx be able to overcome adversity, use long range attacks, kicks and his beautiful boxing to overcome Poirier and possibly submit him and cement his name as the best lightweight on the planet. Aside from that, it's time to discuss the rest of the 155-pound UFC lightweight division. First off, we're going to start with the notorious Conor McGregor, who hasn't had a victory in the UFC since his first-round knockout victory over Donald Cowboy Cerrone at UFC 246 in January of 2020. Coming back after that with two back-to-back losses to the Diamond himself, there is much concern and much to question in terms of where the Notorious One stands if he wants to get back to be the king of 155 pounds. One option for him in his return bout after recovering from injury is a fight that was supposed to happen at UFC 196 with Rafael Dos Anjos. That fight was originally supposed to take place at 155 pounds for the UFC lightweight championship. This would be, I believe, at 170 pounds, or it could potentially take place at 155 pounds, depending on where McGregor would rather fight at. 
But either way, Dos Anjos versus McGregor is a great fight to get McGregor back into the swing of things, potentially get him a win, and give fans the opportunity to see a fight which did not get the chance to take place at UFC 196, a fight that I believe would be very competitive and compelling all at the same time, and show us not only where Conor McGregor lies in terms of a potential shot at the lightweight championship, but also if the man coming off of a decision victory over Paul Felder and a dominant one, albeit that, where he lies in the chance to potentially get another crack at the belt which he once held. Let's talk about the number 5 ranked lightweight contender, the former multiple time Bellator lightweight champion, and somewhat still a UFC newcomer even though his potential fights have fireworks written all over them, in Iron Michael Chandler. Chandler is another option for Conor McGregor, and one that even got started on Twitter when McGregor and Chandler exchanged tweets, and McGregor said that he would, may, he would be willing to fight Michael Chandler if the chance was given to him. McGregor versus Chandler is both a fan favorite and a firefight all at the same time, and one that might make more sense than you think at the current standpoint of both men in the lightweight divisional rankings. This is a fight that would really, really tell us a lot about both men, and one that would not only show us that if McGregor was able to get a win, that he is maybe one win away from a shot at a fourth fight with Dustin Poirier, but it's also a fight where if Chandler was able to get a win, it would not only be the biggest win of his career, but also a fight that would give him another crack at that lightweight champion. Would the dominant offensive wrestling and quick technical striking of Michael Chandler on the feet be too much for the notorious one to handle? Or would Conor McGregor be able to use his hypnotic lateral and in and out movement to box in Michael Chandler, batter up the body with front kicks and teep kicks, and finally find an opening to land that Celtic cross on the chin of iron and put him to sleep? McGregor versus Chandler is a potentially fun fight and one that I definitely could see happening in the near future. But we need to talk about the man who defeated Iron Michael Chandler in that all-out war, that three-round dogfight at UFC 268 in the number two ranked lightweight contender and the former interim lightweight champion in Justin the Highlight Gaethje. Gaethje and Chandler went to war at UFC 268 with Chandler's speed and pressure seeming to be a bit too much for Gaethje in the opening round. He landed beautiful one-twos and even cracked the chin of Justin Gaethje and seemed to wobble him at many points in that first round. We saw a beautiful scramble where Chandler tried to go for a double leg, but Gaethje was able to roll out of it and wind up in the top position. Both men went back and forth and it looked like Gaethje was going to be out of it. But the beautiful calf kicks to that lead leg of Michael Chandler from the specialist of low kicks and probably the best low kicker in MMA, Justin Gaethje, were proving to take their toll. Going into the second round, Justin Gaethje caught Michael Chandler off a level change with a beautiful uppercut which should have knocked him out cold, but but it didn't. They went back and forth for multiple rounds, but Gaethje was able to take over in that second and third and really stake his claim and state that this was his fight to win. This showcased that they were definitely not only the two most violent and most war-ready fighters in that 155-pound division, but two men that could easily contend for the title on any given day. This fight was a battle and a brotherhood written in blood, and one that Gaethje and Chandler and fans all around the world will never forget. But now it leaves Gaethje as the next challenger for the winner of the fight between Poirier and Oliveira at UFC 269. Will the highlight be able to become a two-time lightweight champion, albeit the first time being interim, after that dominant and outclassing performance against Tony Ferguson at the first event of the pandemic era, UFC 249? And will that championship fight be a rematch against a man he went to war with in Dustin the Diamond Poirier, or a new fight? and a fresh matchup against the grappling standout and now dominant striker and clean technician in Charles Dobronx Oliveira. As we wait for those questions to be answered, we now must talk about the number 4 ranked 20-1 lightweight contender and the protege of Habib the Eagle Nurmagomedov in Islam Mahachev. I guess you could say more pupil than protege, but Mahachev is coming off of the most dominant and impressive victory of his entire career, a first-round Kimura submission over a durable contender in Dan the Hangman Hooker, who was coming off of a phenomenal win and a phenomenal performance, probably the best of his career, just one week earlier at UFC 266 against 
Nasrat, Hawkprost. Before, after a brief feeling out process, Mahachev timed a low kick of Dan Hooker, shot in, got the takedown, and was able to work his way to side control before grabbing that Kimura grip and ripping the shoulder of Dan Hooker apart for a quick tap. This quick submission win left the fans in awe, but also left no doubt that Mahachev is not only a future champion in the lightweight division, but is very close to getting that title shot, a lot closer than many may have thought, and also could be a few dominant victories away from continuing the legacy of Habib and being an even more dominant champion than him throughout the rest of his career. Mahachev was supposed to take on Rafael Dos Anjos at UFC 267 before Dos Anjos had to withdraw due to an injury. But prior to this win over Dan Hooker, Mahachev had dominant submission victories over Tiago Moises and also the dominant and dangerous striker in Drew Dober. Mahachev is very close to getting a title shot, but he needs a few more wins in my opinion. But the next fight for him should be against the number 3 ranked... 21-4-1 lightweight contender of King's MMA under the tutelage of Rafael Cordero in Benil Dariush. Dariush versus Mahachev is one of the best fights you could make in that lightweight division currently, and it makes so much sense in terms of developing some clarity at the top of the lightweight division. A standout grappler and a phenomenal striker with a lot of power coming off of a dominant decision victory over Tony Ferguson in Benil Dariush versus a better striker than many people may have thought, and also the most dominant grappler in that division, is a recipe for success and a fight that needs to be booked ASAP. Dariush versus Mahachev needs to be next for both men. Now let's discuss an interesting name. The former 145-pound featherweight champion and the current number one ranked featherweight contender coming off of a decision victory over Yair Rodriguez just a few short weeks ago in Max Blessed. Holloway. And although this was a pretty clear-cut 48-47, three rounds to two decision for the Blast Express, he did have some moments of adversity in this fight, having to deal with a crisp 1-2 from Yair Rodriguez, good lateral movement, and good low kicks and kicks to the body. He even threw some head kicks up there, but Holloway was able to avoid much of the damage from the kicking game of El Pantera. Holloway was even able to get a few takedowns against Yair Rodriguez, which is something we don't see Holloway go for often. This shows that he is ever-evolving and continuing to improve, even though he is at the top of his weight class in the UFC. Prior to this fight against Yair Rodriguez, Holloway was coming off one of the best performances of his entire career in a boxing clinic against some who considered to be the best boxer in a, at 145 pounds, currently in Kelvin Cater. Dodging multiple punches and combinations and slipping while looking at DC on the commentary table and exclaiming, I'm the best boxer in the UFC, baby. And although those best boxer in the UFC claims will have to be put on hold for the time being due to how much damage he took against Yair Rodriguez, he still is one of the best. Is the best blessed? Not currently, but he could be one of the best fighters at 155 pounds if he decides to move up in weight and either challenge Conor McGregor in a rematch, which is something the fans have wanted to see for a long time, or potentially go up against the current 155-pound champion who he has a victory over at 145 pounds in Charles Dobronx Oliveira. If you go back and look at Max Holloway's last fight, at 155 pounds, it was the bout at UFC 236 for the Undisputed Lightweight Championship, or I should say Interim Lightweight Championship, against Dustin the Diamond Poirier. And although it was a pretty dominant performance for the Diamond, blessed Max Holloway did land some good combinations, had Poirier hurt up against the fence, and even won a few rounds in between. And although it was Poirier who got his hand raised on that April night at UFC 236, a move up to 155 pounds is an interesting one. And injecting Max Holloway and the Blessed Express into the veins of the 155-pound lightweight rankings and the top of that division all in the same is something that the fans and all the people around the world who love mixed martial arts would want to see. Blessed versus McGregor or Poirier versus Holloway 2, or Oliveira versus Holloway 2, are just some of the exciting matchups that we could see if Max Holloway made the jump up in weight. Let's move on and discuss Bobby King Green. Coming off of the first TKO finish, or KO finish, or finish in general, 
of his career since 2013 in a fight for the troops against James Krause. He got that win over a man who went five hard rounds with Habib the Eagle Nurmagomedov at UFC 223 in New York on short notice in Raging Al Iaquinta. The unorthodox movement, pivots, shoulder rolls, and head movement of Bobby Green seemed to be too much for Al Iaquinta to digest as he walked right into a straight left hand, got dropped, and got finished with ground and pound in the first round. A huge victory for Bobby King Green who is one of the best defensive fighters in all of mixed martial arts, and definitely the man who uses the shoulder roll boxing style defense the best in his transition to mixed martial arts. Second in that would probably be Dustin Poirier, who is actually the only man to finish Bobby Green in the UFC, and that came via first round KO at UFC 199, the night that Michael Bisping defeated Luke Rockhold to become the middleweight champion. Prior to this win over Raging Ally Quinta, Bobby Green came off a razor-thin decision loss to one of the best strikers at 155 pounds and one of the most decorated strikers in the UFC in Rafael Fazeev. Fazeev came out heavy and hard in the first round and definitely won it. But as the second and third round started moving on, Bobby Green was able to use his, his switch stances, his ability to switch stance to avoid the body kicks and the brunt of the impacts, and use his beautiful counterattacks including a straight left, the pivots, the straight rights, and the combination to get Fazeev tired and start landing more as the fight went on, closing the significant strike gap. Many people believe that Green did enough to defeat Rafael Fazeev, but I believe that Fazeev did enough to just eke out two rounds to one. Now Fazeev will go to battle against former training partner and number 12 ranked lightweight in the UFC, with Fazeev being ranked number 14 in Brad Quake Riddell. The striking standout and former striking coach at City Kickboxing has made a roar in the UFC rankings and is coming off of a dominant decision victory against Drew Dober at UFC 263. I guess you can't call it dominant, so to speak, because Dober did hurt him hard in the first round, dropping him with a straight left hand, but Riddell was able to resort to his defensive wrestling and counter-wrestling to clear the cobwebs, and then these two went to war on the feet again. The beautiful ability to cut off on angles and land the straight right over the straight left hand of Drew Dober was really the story of this fight, and the longer the fight went... Riddell was able to get the timing, get the movement, and get the range down and land that straight right hand at will, even hurting Drew Dober in that third round and finishing it on top after a takedown with some ground and pound. This was the fight that really put Quake on the map. But now Quake versus Adaman, Rafael Fazeev versus Brad Riddell is going to be a battle between the two two of the most decorated strikers in the UFC and definitely two of the best strikers in that lightweight division going to war to see who can crack the top 10. Will Fazeev's explosiveness and speed be too much for Quake early and put him to sleep or will Quake's defense, offensive wrestling and defensive striking ability and his ability to put combinations together on the feet while using good footwork, angles, and movement be too much for Adamant and allow him to take over in the later rounds, potentially getting a late finish or cruising to a dominant clear cut 29-28 unanimous decision. Not much is to be seen until that cage door closes on December 4th at UFC Fight Night Font versus Aldo. Now let's talk about the number 10 ranked Gregor the Gift Gillespie, who is definitely a gift in terms of wrestling ability, both offensively and defensively, to that 155-pound lightweight division. Gillespie was the man who many people believed would be able to dethrone Habib. If those two were ever to cross paths in their careers in the UFC... Unfortunately, Habib retired before these two were able to cross paths, but Gregor Gillespie came back after that brutal head kick KO against Kevin Lee at UFC 244 and came back with a vengeance. He did have a close first round against Diego Ferreira in his return bout, but he was able to use his wrestling, use his top control, use his constant forward pressure and chain wrestling to tire out Fedetta, get in the top position, and get a TKO at the closing moments of the second round. This announced with a vengeance that Gregor Gillespie, the gift, was not going anywhere, and he could be a future contender for that title. With the dominant wrestling, suffocating top pressure, and ground and pound for days, and the ability to make you quit before he even has to take a second win, Gillespie is a problem and a future contender without a doubt.
We can't forget about the number 13 ranked training partner of Piotr Jan, the current UFC bantamweight champion, in Armin Sarukian. Sarukian is coming off of a dominant first round KO victory over Christos Yagos and is also the man to give Islam Mahachev his toughest fight in the UFC in terms of offensive and defensive wrestling ability. These men put on a grappling clinic for 15 straight minutes with Mahachev landing a foot sweep into the full mount, Armin Sadukian being the first man to take our Islam Mahachev down in his entire UFC career, which is a huge feat in and of itself. And although he lost that fight via decision, Sadukian is a man who could give Gregor Gillespie one of the toughest fights of his career, and a man that I believe should face Gillespie next in his journey to become a top five ranked lightweight contender and potentially a lightweight champion in the years to come. And although this next contender is unranked currently at 155 pounds, he's coming off of a first round submission over Jeremy Lil Heathen Stevens, and that is Mateus Gamrot. Gamrot is currently 19-1 and in professional mixed martial arts and has looked nothing but dominant in his UFC career. He currently has a fight booked against Diego Ferreira for December 18th, 2021. Ferreira versus Gamrot is definitely a fantastic fight for the fans of the lightweight division and for some more clarity, which is the whole entire point of this video, at 155 pounds. Will Diego Ferreira be able to use his offensive striking on the feet and hurt Gamrot? Or will Gamrot be able to land good strikes on the feet, use his wrestling and use his superior Brazilian jiu-jitsu to lock up a submission and stake his claim as one of the brightest prospects in that division with another victory over a veteran? And although this may be an unfortunate way to close out this video on the state of the UFC's lightweight division, we need to talk about the rise and fall and hard downfall of the boogeyman, Tony Ferguson. Ferguson is on a three-fight losing streak, and it looks like he may never be the same again, and it looks like he may never even get a win in the UFC. Will the man who was once pegged to defeat the eagle Habib Nurmagomedov, and the man who was once considered the best lightweight in the world, never be the same again, never get a win in the UFC, and coming off of a three-fight losing streak to Justin Gaethje, Charles Oliveira, and Benil Dariush, call it a day and call it a career in MMA.